Hi, I'm Betsy Rosenberg. Welcome to this edition of Green TV. One of the many subjects that I have heard about for so many years when I did my green radio shows, but haven't really had a chance to interview too many experts on the subject of hydrogen. Hydrogen, it seems, has been in and out of favor over the years. We've heard it's the answer. No, it's not. And then it is, and then it's not. And there's all kinds of different applications for it. So I am really looking forward to our chat today because we have two hydrogen proponents joining us today from not so much different viewpoints, but different backgrounds. So first, I want to introduce you to Roy McAllister, who I should say is the father of a friend of mine. And I met Sarah. Uh, at a writing retreat about eight years ago. And when we figured out we were writing about the environment, she said, you've got to meet my dad. So we finally got to meet in person a couple of days ago since you were visiting Austin. And what a pleasure, what an honor, and to learn more about your work. So I'm going to just give some highlights from your extensive and impressive bio. Uh, Roy built his first hydrogen car when he was 17. You have a master's degree in engineering from the University of Kansas, uh, engineering professor at Arizona State University, uh, you have over 90 patents and applications. That's amazing. Uh, founder of American Hydrogen Association. That was in 1989. It's a nonprofit. And today you lecture all over the world, or you did till COVID, I would imagine. Perhaps you do it on Zoom. Currently a board president of the American Hydrogen Association. And your mission statement, if I may read it here from your materials, to develop and improve solar hydrogen technologies that will eliminate economic, environmental, and energy hardships caused by burning 1 million years of accumulated fossil fuels every year. And also to educate scientists, entrepreneurs, talk show hosts like myself, uh, experimenters, parents, and kids, and CEOs, legislators, utilities, the media, yes. We're gonna introduce uh, John in just a minute, but what I just have to say, um, without further ado, thank you for all the work you've done for decades. Um, I feel like I've been at this a long time, and. It's only um, a quarter of a century. I started Green Radio 25 years ago. Uh, that feels like ages ago. So I can only imagine, especially fighting for something you believe in, as I have for Green Media. Um, tell us you know, what it's been like, and then we'll get to this moment after we introduce John. Thank you, Betsy. It's a pleasure to be here with you. The main topic that inspired me to dedicate my heartbeats on this earth to the hydrogen economy occurred when I was teaching at the University of Kansas and realized, as you mentioned, that we were burning a million years of fossil accumulations per year to carry on the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution has been great for developing lots of different technologies, amazing technologies, but we've done so without a clue about sustainability. We've been burning up without putting any measure of replacement cost in the value that we take to the marketplace for all of the good things that we do in the industrial revolution. So we're, we're economically non-sustainable. We're in a temporary economy. You may consider that the economy of thieves because we do not account for the replacement cost of the fossil materials that we burn, the natural gas, the oil, coal and so forth, nor do we pay for the environmental impact. So it's, it's really important pretty, pretty soon, pretty suddenly, now that global warming is looming and we're- Here, in, yeah. <laughs> arrived on our shores, yes. We're, we're in a, a truly environmental crisis presently because we've neglected our responsibility to be sustainable in our energy conversion and in our environmental protection. But with that, let me just say, I'm anxious to meet with, with John and really pick up on his topic of interest and that's fuel cells. It's one of my okay. favorite topics. We're gonna to introduce John right now. Uh, John Michael Parkan uh, is president at uh, Providence Entertainment in Beverly Hills, or you were uh, USC grad. I think you're on the East Coast right now. Uh, but most importantly, you're a filmmaker uh, for a documentary I can't wait to see. It's called At War with the Dinosaurs. And I, I feel like I've been at war with the Dinosaurs. So John, you've, this documentary obviously is absolutely what Roy is talking about. We're at war with the dinosaurs, or as my husband says, and he's a lawyer and businessman, nothing to do with film, 
or the environment. Why are we burning up the planet? Why is everything about burning that we haven't progressed at all since the caveman? So, so John, I understand it was this film that really woke you up to the hydrogen opportunity, perhaps the environmental crisis. And uh, tell us a little bit about how that began and where it's taken you up till now. Well, thanks for having me. Um, it, it began a while ago, over a decade ago, I started, I, you know, I, I woke up one day and thought I, I got to find the successor to fossil fuels. And I realized that I might be doing this for slightly selfish reasons because of, you know, air quality and, and things like that. And I, I was an avid biker and, um, you know, I, I told this to my wife and she said, I, absolutely think, you know, you should do it. You should make a documentary, even though I'd never made a documentary before. So um, basically we started doing research and we kept coming back to this thing, fuel cells and hydrogen. And I realized that I, I had a film because uh, Larry Burns at GM um, at one point stood up in front of all the energy companies and all the other, uh, other automotive OEMs and the state of California and just begged for 40 stations so that they could put a hundred plus vehicles out on the marketplace and just hand the keys over to people and just get data and see what people thought and just had people drive these vehicles in the real world. And they couldn't actually, they couldn't actually get that done. And so that, that project driveway that they had had languished for two years and they finally started building their own stations these mobile refuelers that were in these shipping containers and just dropping them in places and then handing keys out to people that were local to those locations. And that's how they had to get it done. And he was just simply looking for 40 stations in a concentrated area just so they could try and figure out how they were going to create a network and build on that and sell vehicles. And um, it, you know, it took the better part of a decade. They have only 48 stations now in, in California. But what we realized along the way, um, as we followed these, these guys, uh, the California Fuel Cell Partnership and essentially every single automotive OEM, um, at the time, nine of them drove across the United States uh, from uh, Portland, Maine, down to the Science Center in California. And then the, that was in 2008, 2009, we followed them from um, Chula Vista, California, all the way up to Vancouver. And, you know, they just, they had the vehicles and they just needed to sort of put them out in the real world and learn from them. And then we, we you know, discovered all these other knock-on effects with hydrogen and fuel cells and electrolyzers. Like it's a fantastic storage medium. So you can basically split water, take the hydrogen and compress it. And when you compress it, you get energy densities that equal, you know, plutonium and uranium and thorium um, when you compress it to what's called 700 bar, which is about 10,000 psi. And you can put that in a tank and put it on a shelf for 20 years, and the 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 leakage from that would be negligible, almost immeasurable. And so we just we discovered slowly as we talked to more and more people that we had something. So we we actually followed this to nine different countries and filmed in all of these countries and interviewed people and, and you know, sort of discovered what they were doing with hydrogen and fuel cells. And um, we realized, you know, we, we were able to put together, I think a pretty compelling film as to why we should be doing this and why we're not currently doing it. And I was planning on watching it over the weekend, but with all the climate damage, I just was monitoring as I do to see, now that they're talking about climate change, who's saying it, how much time they gave it, which is the reason for green TV, but that's another story, but I really look forward to seeing it. I, I love the title. And um, I, we met John and I on Clubhouse, which for those who don't know is a new social media audio app. And so I've gone into some rooms on hydrogen and I keep thinking I need to tell Sarah to tell Roy that he's got to get on this app because they're talking about something he's been dedicated to and working on for decades. And you, you were in that room, John, you were on stage uh, with some skeptics and Roy was, I think, able to hear some of that. Uh, just before we get into more of your work, Roy, I just want to ask each of you, starting with Roy, like what does that evoke in you when you hear people who are so quick to put down hydrogen and they know a hell of a lot less than you do, you've devoted your life to it, um, and how that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, people saying it won't work before they gave it a chance. Well, it can. The part that I heard was, was John rebutting 
I thought he did a very good job. Valiantly, valiantly. I thought, I thought it was a very good summary in rebuttal that brought out the very important observations that if everybody wanted a, a car that used copper and cobalt and samarium and neodymium and lithium at the rate that has been shown in the Tesla, they couldn't have them. We, we don't have enough in the Earth's crust to supply it. It was mentioned that we could get some of these in ocean water and refine ocean water. Well, we can get gold out of ocean water too, but doing so takes a lot more energy than you can get out of the gold that you might take to market afterwards. In other words, it is not economically viable to do so. So it's really important to look at the Earth's resources and find adequate materials to do what we need to do. And one thing that I've been dedicated to is to develop fuel cells that use materials that we'll never run out of, mostly carbon, and to use carbon also as the winding for electric motors and devices so we'd never run out of a field developed by a good conductor it can be better than copper as a copper has a number of limitations, not only material shortage, but it loses conductivity with temperature, temperatures that you could operate easily with carbon, even at temperatures that would melt copper or aluminum alloy windings. So there's a new world coming, and I think it's going to be the fuel cell world, hydrogen fuel cell world. But in the meantime, we can make the market pull for hydrogen at that's needed for the fuel cell world by converting existing refineries and ethanol plants to produce a fuel that we have trademarked Metrol, M-A-T-R-O-L. It has the characteristics of being born from the first step of taking hydrogen from anything that would rot or burn, including renewable methane or natural gas and co-producing carbon for durable goods that can be stronger than steel and lighter than aluminum. Hmm. And, and a very important application to reinforce equipment to collect and convert solar energy or wind energy or moving water energy or geothermal energy into hundreds of times more electricity or hydrogen or heat every year for decades, many decades, compared to taking such material, methane, to a furnace or a boiler or a gas turbine or a piston engine or a power plant and losing that carbon one time is carbon dioxide production. So by making carbon a durable good, you have a much larger economic development potential and you have the ability to take metro net hydrogen liquid fuel through the infrastructure that already exists to service stations. So every service station can be a service station to refuel a fuel cell vehicle, as, oh. as well as refueling all of the combustion engines and transportation that now exist, and having the result in the combustion engines with smart plugs that provide stratified hydrogen combustion to clean the air, actually clean the air during operation. That's what's so, amazing. You said this can clean up the air, and it sounds like such a win-win one has to think, well, why hasn't this caught on? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. I want to show a short video that you kindly provided us, Roy, about this process in a very basic overview sense and introduce Metro. Good. This is a reality check for anyone who thinks that electric cars are the answer to addressing climate change. These folks are simply not doing the math with regard to combustion engines. I'm talking about internal combustion engines, cars, trucks, buses, trains, etc., and external combustion engines, which means power plants and industrial machines. The number of combustion engines is going to continue rising through the next 10 years, regardless of what we do with electric cars. A lot of climate activists seem to think we have 30 years to work things out. We don't. Like it or not, we're now facing some hard deadlines and critical limits just ahead. The IPCC maximum amount for atmospheric carbon before a tipping point occurs is shown here, along with the 2030 IPCC deadline to fix this dilemma. 
The sloping line heading up to and past the tipping point threshold shows that EVs are not going to solve the problem by 2030, not even close. It's too little, too late. The 2030 intersection is when climate catastrophe occurs if we don't do something in the next 10 to 12 years about the combustion engines burning carbon. By converting over 1 billion combustion engines to run on the new net hydrogen fuel called Metrol, we can detoxify them. It's doable. There's simply no other choice, folks. We have the technology. It just needs to be commercialized. And if someone has a better idea, we're all ears. The video shows the yeah. very difficult situation that we're in, and it really shows the numbers for carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas and particulates accumulating in the atmosphere to the point that we're very near another tipping point in this global crisis. It's a, it's a really serious tipping point that we're facing currently. But by the way, we've already passed a number of tipping points. The, all of the efforts of socialism and capitalism and communism together, along with the institutions of the world, did nothing about the fact that we passed the point where all the money in the world, all the wealth, descriptions of wealth in the world, couldn't pay the price of refreezing what's already melted in polar ice and glacial stores of frozen water. We've let that water go. We can't pay the price for refreezing it. So that's really an important tipping point that we've passed. And then we're about to pass another one where it isn't enough to do the job of overcoming local pollution. That, that isn't enough. We have to now look to the permafrost that's failing and melting and releasing carbon dioxide and methane and to the ocean bottom clathrates or hydrates of methane that are being released in enormous amounts to cause global warming that's it's a runaway self loop, exaggerating runaway thermal increase of the Earth's surface. A runaway so freight train coming for all of us. Well, it is, and it, it hasn't paid any attention to whether or not we're ready. It's coming. Well, um, we're going to talk about green and blue hydrogen. I've heard those terms uh, bandied about quite a bit and get into that. Um, but I wanted to just ask you, John, did everything Roy say resonate with you? Uh, anything you would either take issue with um, or support very strongly? Oh, I, I support very strongly. I mean, there, there's a number of tipping points that we know about or we think we know about at this point. We don't know that we're beyond a tipping point until we actually pass it and look back. Then it's and too late. <laughs> yeah, it's a really scary time, especially with, you know, you know, like Roy was talking about, you know, the methane that's coming up through the ground, um, because, you know, as the permafrost melts. Um, I think what's happening in Greenland right now is very scary. If the, you know, the glaciers continue to melt there and if, if Greenland, you know, does you lose its ice, I mean, we're talking, you know, at least a three meter rise um, from yeah. what I understand in, in sea level. And, you know, it, that it, is going to be- And the rain, the rain is going to help melt the ice. I mean, that's never happened yeah. before, right? Yeah. And plus, you know, what's going on in Antarctica where there's, you know, large sheets that you know, could become dislodged and sink into the ocean and also raise uh, sea level. So yeah, there's just, there's a lot of stuff going on. And we, you know, I think, you know, Kevin Anderson, uh, who's a British um, uh, climate scientist, you know, really gets you scared about this and really, you know, I've, I've been in the room call. Him, yeah. Yeah, I thought yeah, I was, scared. he made me scared her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 you know, you have to be careful because you can almost be depressed to a point where you don't do anything about it. But now I just, we have to call a climate emergency. I mean, this has to be done. And, and I think that the target of, you know, essentially switching over by 2029 should be our new target, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, in order to just turn off fossil fuels at this point, you know, all new construction and production, um, you know, that's out there now. Uh, my understanding is that we're, Biden's kind of going in the opposite direction in the, in the last few days by, you know, releasing, you know, a lot of land apparently more, more than was under Trump, um, which is interesting, but, you know. Interesting. I, I, yeah, I think the power is with us, honestly. And if enough of us, you know, raise our voices, we can help stop this thing and help reverse it. 
Wow. Okay. So both of you have encountered naysayers. I heard it just in a clubhouse room. I can only imagine. Is there a lobby that's against hydrogen? Why are people who are against it so sure of themselves when you two are such strong believers? Well, I, I, yeah. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> well, I'd say that the marketing department of every major energy company, meaning every fossil sourced energy company, are bound to determine to keep their market share no matter what. So the strategic planning that needs to be done at the board level needs to be joined. There needs to be a logic at the board of directors level to provide the company a much brighter future by making more money by not burning carbon, not in, in, in any way, depending upon the burning of carbon for their future. And do you, do you see a future for the Shells and Exxons of the world to transfer over to hydrogen or would they just go the way of the dinosaur and that's why they're fighting so hard? Well, it's uh, up to them. I mean, it's absolutely up to them. But I would say that it's uh, much too late for them to ignore what is already well known by the public. As John said, you know, the majority of the public knows the problem. Problem is that we can no longer depend upon gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel when we have much better alternatives. Hydrogen is an example of the better alternative, but natural, you can go to the existing infrastructure, the service stations, and find the company that wants to begin it, and they'll be the winner of the opportunity to bring fuel that cleans the air in existing furnaces and boilers, gas turbines, and all the other piston engines, 2 billion piston engines around so, the world. So John, why has hydrogen met with yellow lights and red lights more than green lights in your view? Well, uh, just to sort of, um, you know, point out what, what Roy was saying, I really do think that, you know, the, uh, the Chevrons and the Shells of the world, especially the, the European um, energy companies, Vattenfall, Total, um, there's a few others, I think that they see the writing on the wall. Sure. And and for this, you know, they realize that, I mean, they've already been hit really hard uh, because of COVID um, and, and their profit margins of, I think, you know, split in half from what they used to be. Um, and they understand that they're not going to be making as much profit in the future because when you move to a renewable uh, across the board, when you move to renewables, it halves the price that you're spending on energy. So, but I also think that they are very large companies and they want to survive. Um, and they, and, and frankly, we need them. I mean, we're talking about a $6 trillion, you know, hegemony that, that needs to be flipped sure. over to uh, renewables across the board. And that is not easy and that's not going to happen overnight. And so we do need the, the ones that want to survive. Um, as far as the intransigence, intransigence that we encountered, um, I will say that uh, two years into our documentary and about four years in, the producers and I just turned to each other and just said, okay, are the, battery, are the hydrogen guys just pulling the wool over our eyes? Because I will tell you, there, there's, a, there's an animosity that exists on one, in one of those camps and not the other. In other words, I don't, we don't get a sense of the animosity that hydrogen guys have with battery guys because every hydrogen fuel cell vehicle has a small battery in it um, sure. as well. But, you know, what I will say is that the, a certain segment of battery folks are very adamant that, you know, it is their way and, uh, you know, hydrogen is just, um, that it can't really happen. They can't scale. It's not real. I mean, they, they said all these, these things to us and, and they, they really did have us completely convinced a couple of times during the making of the project. And then we, we suddenly that, realized- that Gaslighting, where they make you question your own sanity and everything you think you know, so to speak, gaslighting? <laughs> well, the thing is, is that when you get into the physics of, of what's actually happening, right? Um, and, you, and you realize, you start talking about things like energy density that, yeah, sure, hydrogen is a gas. And when it's released, it, it doesn't pool like gasoline. It wants to go up very fast in the atmosphere, 90 feet per second squared, which is great. Um, it doesn't burn 
uh, it, it's got a higher, a wider flammable dynamic range than gasoline. But the, the thing is, um, when you have a hydrogen fire, you can put your hand next to it and not get burned. And so um, the automakers and everybody else that's been involved in hydrogen for the last 70 years, including all of the energy companies, they know how to handle it because they've been doing it for so long. And so there's a, so once you realize, okay, we need energy density that's equal to like nuclear forces, right? Like, like uh, nuclear power um, that I mentioned earlier. And when you realize that, oh, all you have to do is compress it to 700 bar or compress it down to liquid, it, it becomes a win-win situation because what happens is, is that uh, a kilogram of hydrogen can move your car twice as far as a gallon of gasoline. That's sort of the way it works. That's why when you fill like a Toyota um, Mirai or a Honda Clarity or a Hyundai Nexo, you're only putting about five or six kilograms of hydrogen. And yet you can go between three and 400 miles depending on the vehicle and depending on how you drive. But um, in that respect, I think it's a win-win situation. It's also a win-win situation when we started looking at things like not just for seasonal storage, but for long-term storage. You can store it for decades at a time as opposed to days or weeks with batteries. And then you can also start to replace the gas grid as well. So the existing gas grid, and, and Roy alluded to this, can be blended with hydrogen. And so they're doing that in the UK and, and, and China and other places right now. And so, you know, what I think is, is that, you know, because hydrogen has, you know, all of these pluses, you know, it can take over um, the bunker fuel that we now burn in ships for maritime. That's um, a big problem, pollution. At, the, yeah, pollution. the jet A fuel for jets from very small, you know, jets to, you know, very large commercial jets and, and a, a number of the, uh, Airlines have have already said that by 2035 that they believe they're going to have jets running on hydrogen. Sure. And, and so, you know, when you when you see the kind of like what's happening in like little niche sectors as well, like there's something called materials handling, which is basically, you know, forklifts and yard dogs, things like that, in big huge warehouses, and all of those were actually running on propane, which you can't really run indoors, or they were running on hydrogen. And when you see like you know, all these large companies like UPS and FedEx and Coke um, and Walgreens and um, Wegmans and Cisco Foods, when you see those guys and now Amazon switching over and, and basically pulling the batteries out of those units and putting hydrogen fuel cells in it, and they get, they get the win-win benefit of, they can, tr they can have a forklift on the floor for the entire shift of their employees which is great. They don't have to have a separate room for changing batteries out, which could have a line to that room that could be up to an hour long. They don't have to have three batteries per vehicle. So a battery charging, a battery on the vehicle and about battery cooling off. I mean, there's a lot of win-wins in terms of productivity and, and savings in terms of, you know, uh, how many forklifts that they can have out there at any one time and how quickly they can turn those around. I mean, these things are happening in, in different industries and the light duty vehicle industry is one of them, but now there's, there's, a, there's been a big movement now. Um, first, the light duty vehicles were too expensive um, back when there were prototypes. And then they, were, um, they weren't believing, you know, Toyota, when Toyota announced that they were gonna have a vehicle in the $50,000 range. I think Toyota said that in 2010, they said by 2015, they'd have one in the $50,000 range and, and they did. A hydrogen and vehicle that ran a on- A hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, yeah. And then, you know, they, um, you know, then when the vehicles came out, the vehicles were too ugly. Um, and, you know, they, they, you know, the new meme now is, is that it's never gonna work in light duty vehicles. It may work in sort of your class six or class eight, um, seven and eight vehicles out there. So like the class eight is going to be your, you know, your standard 18 wheel big rig. And, you know, these vehicles are lighter, they can go farther. And again, as Roy alluded to, as you drive a fuel cell vehicle, it actually cleans up the air as you drive. Hyundai is selling their vehicle in South Korea. And in 2019, they only thought they were going to 
you know, build and sell 1500. They ended up um, selling 5,500 of them. They is couldn't it, make enough of them. Is it because the fossil fuel industry is so strong in this country that we've been laggards again and look at China and their manufacturing of solar panels, you know, way ahead of us. Is, is, is it a financial political problem? Not so much a physical problem. That's one question. And then I do want to hear from Roy about technology that he has created uh, years ago and has tried to bring to the marketplace and some of the obstacles he's met. Well, t Tesla's done a phenomenal job. They made a sexy vehicle that goes very fast. Um, it's not necessarily afford affordable for everyone, but they've you know created an industry and they've they created their own ecosystem with their charging network. Their charging network is you know anything is nothing like the charging network for the rest of the people in any other electric vehicle that's out there. And, and I had a Volt while we were making um, the documentary in post-production, while we were completing the post-production work. I drove a Volt to the production facility every day. And you know when you sort of exist in that space, it's, it's the wild, wild west. Can you find a charger? Is it going to be occupied? Is it working or is it broken? Are you going to get a solid charge? Are you amp splitting with other cars that are plugged in? You know, all those sorts of things. Um, some of that happens in the, in the Tesla network, but um, they've taken care of their customers a lot better. And I think they're, they've built it out uh, much better. So hats off to them. Uh, Elon Musk is completely wrong when it comes to fuel cell vehicles. I mean, I, I think they're operating more out of fear uh, that this could take over because it remains to be seen as to whether or not people are actually going to want to switch to a battery electric lifestyle. I mean, it is a different lifestyle. You are spending not just the expense on the vehicle itself, but you're also building out the charging network as well. And, and yeah. We don't have enough charging exactly. stations for battery powered cars, which, by the way, neither one of you think is going to save us electric vehicles solely electric. Right. I want to give Roy a chance. Um, I, I'm sure based on my conversations with you, you agree with all this. What is it that you, and you showed me a little photovoltaic photosynthesis conversion of solar to hydrogen um, when you came over the other day. So is that what you have invented or is that just the latest iteration of what you have invented and been trying valiantly, persistently to bring to the marketplace? Well, it's one of the applications of carbon that goes to the roof as a combination PV for electricity production and heat control, heat collection when you need heat and heat avoidance for the dwelling as in the cooling season. So it's a, it's a material that can be made for about the price of bubble wrap, it goes on your roof in dimensions that are comparable to a rug, border to border of the, of the roof or of the wall of a tall building. It becomes the curtain wall, so to speak, that collects energy and provides whatever the building aesthetics desire and color for development of energy that is delivered at a much higher efficiency than the present grid can deliver energy in the combination of electricity and heat. And virtually that application of carbon, again, provides hundreds of times more electricity or hydrogen or heat every year than if you had burned that material in a natural gas fueled furnace or boiler or engine of any kind or power plant. So you get a much larger return on carbon investment by not burning carbon, but by putting it to work. That, that material is also one of the family of carbon materials that are stronger than steel and lighter than aluminum and can be more conductive than copper. Now, you showed, me, right. you showed me a plastic part of your latest invention, or maybe that was just an example, a microcosm of what you foresee, but you said this would be a great use of recycled plastic, which is another huge problem. And what you showed me looked like something that would win a science fair, meaning it was brilliant in its simplicity. And is that what you're describing, or is that yet another piece of technology that you have patented? <laughs> Well, no, that this describes it accurately. That's a way to use anything that now is considered a waste plastic. Instead, it turns into carbon and this roofing material. But I can also turn waste polymers, plastics, thermoplastic and thermosets into a reinforcement for asphalt so you don't get chuck holes out of its use. It gives a much longer life. 
lower maintenance, but it can also turn that asphalt white. So you get a much better albedo for rejecting heat instead of adding it to the Earth's surface, as we now do with the black asphalt covering so much of our cities. And, and albedo, I know the albedo effect because I took Al Gore's climate training 2006, but just briefly tell our viewers who may not know what that means, um, that, that phenomenon. Well, we, we need to be re-radiating out to space much of the heat that we're instead trapping at the surface of the earth. And so one way to help cities not be heat zones, traps. heat traps, heat, heat, traps, heat, heat <laughs> islands, uh -huh. is by turning that asphalt to a lighter color, white, and making it possible to develop a much longer life, lower maintenance roadway for operation. But it's also important to realize that we can make many, many more things out of carbon. We can reinforce virtually any of the concrete products and reduce the amount of concrete used to reduce the amount of calcining or Portland cement preparation for the construction industry and for the bonding agent in blocks, cinder blocks, and other building products. Hmm. We can do much more than that in terms of putting carbon to work. And again, it's in harnessing the moving water, the moving air, the wind, and the geothermal energy that now goes unused in, in large part because we don't have the building materials at the price needed. But I can supply hydrogen at, as a liquid at your service station pump at less than a dollar per kg, less than a dollar per gallon. That's what I wanted to ask was how many metro stations and how many fuel cell vehicles are out there right now and are they concentrated in certain states? Well, there's not enough fuel cell vehicles, but we can use the existing vehicles to bring the market, the economy of scale that's needed. So fuel cells will come with a much better market opportunity with lower cost hydrogen available everywhere that there's gasoline or diesel or jet fuel sold today. And by the way, we can replace the lead acid battery in any existing vehicle with a fuel cell when we have metro available in the tank. And now we're able to use that combination of fuel cell and engine as a hybrid to do much better than ever before with existing vehicles, what we've already built. Two billion existing vehicles can do this. I think but I, I want to talk about, again, impediments, because it's almost like hydrogen is like nuclear power, where people think Three Mile Island as soon as they hear nuclear, or God forbid the Hindenburg. I know that was ages ago and start, certainly far advanced from that. But you know, most people don't have anything close to the sophisticated knowledge, obviously, you guys have, your experts. Um, what... Um, and it's like people have an opinion on nuclear, just like people seem to have a strong opinion on hydrogen. And it's, it's consistent. And you guys have lived it. I've just listened to it, right? Um, what do you, I'd like to hear from each of you, what you think is needed right now to really blow the lid off? And maybe the way these storms are blowing the lid off life as we knew it, literally flattening whole towns and people have lost their homes. You know, it, it should be a giant wake up call. So do you think people will be more, um, open to hearing about the fact that we need all hands on deck. There's no way that one thing is gonna get us there, not you know this, not battery powered electric cars, and that we need to pursue everything and get over yourselves if you're anti-hydrogen because those who are proponents know and have known that it's needed. It can be part of the solution. Can it be part of the solution? Or do we have to do all or nothing? Like we got to switch over to hydrogen and electric cars Obviously, we need to get rid of internal combustion engines. Like, can, can it be just part of the mix, I guess, is what I'm asking. And I guess uh, we'll go to you, John. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think California has already proved this. And they didn't just prove it to the United States. They proved it to the world. And that's why right now the rest of the world is moving this direction. You know, there, um, there's a, a great story about a, a taxi company uh, in Paris called Hype. And they, you know, I think started with something like 25 vehicles and then they went to 75 and, you know, now they're talking about doing thousands of vehicles and they, I think they're, they're partly responsible for getting the 
um, you know, the, the government in France to, I think it was in 2019, allocate about $109 million just for hydrogen fueling. And uh, like in California, I know, I know they've had it's been a difficult sort of, you know, uh, growth in, in fits and spurts with them. Um, they've, they've had, you know, a number of instances where, where, you know, consumers could not get the fuel for, you know, if there was a, a hurricane and things like that. Um, they also learned their lesson that one company is basically su uh, supplying 80% of the fuel in the state, but they did get, you know, thousands of vehicles in uh, on the road and thousands of, of consumers driving those vehicles. And predominantly, I, I think, you know, those consumers like them, they don't like the fact that when they can't get fuel, and I think that's been the biggest impediment and also just getting the numbers of stations out there. I think that's the other thing that has to be done. In, in California, I think those things are being solved right now. It, you know, um, I think what's happening is that, uh, you know, at the state level, there are some legislators now that, that see that. And then also, uh, so there's about 20 of them right now that are trying to get uh, the current governor of, of California to put about $300 million just in hydrogen in fueling infrastructure there. And uh, if they do that, California will reach a tipping point. I mean, private industry is already getting involved uh, with this. So uh, Air Liquide and Messier and um, Air, Air uh, Products, um, and, a, and a bunch of other smaller plug power, those guys are um, all, you know, built not only building stations, but also, you know, building renewable um, supplies. There's a, a first quarter of next year, there's a very large, uh, um, like something like 30,000 tons of hydrogen uh, that's going to be online and available for California alone for fueling and transportation, which is going to change it in that's that's 30,000 tons a day and my understanding is that can fuel about 35,000 cars the, the nice thing about this is that you know the rest of the US has sort of dropped the ball there's been stations in the northeast for you know 5 and 6 years now that are not open yet but there are over 30 countries right now that all have a uh, hydrogen um, roadmap that's part of their economic recovery plan there's another 10 countries on top of that, the United States being one of them. Um, we just announced, uh, you know, this hydrogen, um, essentially a moonshot at this point where they're gonna try and get to a dollar a kilogram uh, for hydrogen by the end of the decade. And then there's China and with China, we've awoken a sleeping giant. And basically what's happened with them is they are spending tens of billions of dollars on this. They, they, they've already gone the route where they put batteries everywhere. They, they can put, you know, 3,500 battery electric buses in one city in China, but, you know, they realize that they're, that they have very, you know, specific routes that they have to follow. They don't do well in hills. They don't do well in cold, uh, um, uh, you know, cold weather. And, uh, Charging is, is an issue and also expanding that charging infrastructure when you want to is an issue. So other companies are stepping up, but it's, it's amazing to see who is. I mean, who would have thought the UAE and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is spending $5 billion on a wind and solar facility. And by 2025, they want to start selling green hydrogen um, on the open market because that's the new gold rush. The new gold rush is green hydrogen. The green rush. Okay, we, green we, rush. we just have a couple minutes left, but give us a quick definition, whichever of you, either one of you can respond. What is green hydrogen? What is blue hydrogen? And what is just hype? <laughs> hydrogen hype. Do <laughs> um, well, you have help with that? Yeah, well, all the colors are indicating some degree of pollution development in producing hydrogen. The green supposes that if you start with renewable energy and electrolysis of water, you have the best, but you don't. Turns out that the, the color you really want is diamond green, meaning that you take carbon from what would have rotted or burned and produce hydrogen as a co-product. And that hydrogen 
then means that you have something that's far better than taking hydrogen from water. Because now you have the carbon that you can use to make all of your solar collection, wind conversion, water conversion, and geothermal conversion that does much, much better than just producing oxygen by taking hydrogen from water. Well, I, I don't pretend to understand all this, but I want to leave our viewers with enough information they can go seek more information. And we are going to put up links to both of your work, but blue hydrogen, is that what it sounds like? It's somehow getting hydrogen from the ocean or from bodies of water? I'm guessing, because I really honestly don't know. No, it means that you've taken the hydrogen by utilizing a fuel that, such as natural gas to make the electricity for electrolysis. But what I'm saying is that it takes less energy, very important point, to make hydrogen and carbon from what would have rotted or burned and polluted the atmosphere. And, and importantly, to answer your question about the fear of hydrogen, you don't have to worry anybody about the properties of hydrogen, you just serve them in a net hydrogen liquid fuel at a lower price that actually cleans the air in its application in existing combustion engines and furnaces and boilers. And, and you'll have a rapid market development in that regard in an economy of scale for the fuel cell world that's coming. And all of the service stations that exist can be the place where fuel cell vehicles go to refuel. And you don't have any cost of new infrastructure required at all. Mm -hmm. You just replace gasoline and diesel okay. fuel with Metro. We just have a couple more minutes and I do have one more question. So John, you want to just weigh in quickly on green versus blue versus diamond hydrogen? Well, I, I think that what's happened with uh, Mark Jacobson and uh, Robert um, Hoath's paper is that- uh, Mark Jacobson you know, is a Stanford- Yeah, he's a, he's a Stanford professor and uh, they're both you know, they, they've both in a, in, a, in a very sort of distinct and specific scenario, um, they've shown why blue hydrogen uh, is, is not going to work. Um, and, you know, to a large extent, you know, what they're saying when they're saying that the fossil fuel industry just, you know, wants to give new life to things like natural gas. We used to think it was a, a transition fuel, certainly, but things are so bad now and we've waited so long that it can't be a transition fuel. And, you know, if you're going to do some infrastructure expansion or switch over, you know, do you want to go to like natural gas um, and then to hydrogen, which sort of is like the holy grail and has been for a very long time, or you just want to jump right to hydrogen. And so, there, there are so many projects right now around the world that have completely focused on green hydrogen that I think, you know, that paper has buried blue hydrogen at this point, um, and, and probably rightly so. But you, you got to understand, there's a lot of countries, including Australia. Australia is going to take Queensland solar, split water, transmute it into ammonia, ship it to, um, you know, to South Korea and to Japan, Two countries that have to import 95% of their energy. And as, as soon as CSIRO in Australia had found a way to, you know, basically turn hydrogen to ammonia and then back again cheaply and expensively, um, the contracts are signed. There's been a ship that's already been built to transport the ammonia to to Japan, that's already happened, and it happened pretty rapidly. And so a lot of these economies are based on coal or based on natural gas or based on oil can switch over and, and they're going to. The market is just pushing them and people are pushing them this way. Something we're seeing right now unfold with the latest horror cane, as I call them, you know, hitting Louisiana. And uh, it was, you know, New Orleans in 2005, 16 years ago, when Katrina hit, I was on the air and I said, this is climate change arrived on our shores. Mark my words, and it's not because I'm so smart, it's because I had immersed myself in that science. And it was clear, mm -hmm. even though the scientists were reluctant to say, we can't put any one weather event and tie it to climate change. It's like, I can, <laughs> I'm not qualified to, but woman's intuition, whatever, this is not normal weather. And what we're seeing now, so during Katrina, all the, and also Hurricane Rita, the oil rigs were loosened because of the intense, intensely strong winds, mm -hmm. not normal, you know, got, got loosened from their moors and they, they were, 
adrift and there wasn't a way to get gasoline to the giant SUVs that were heading north or trying to, you know, from Galveston, Texas. And it's like, what's wrong with this picture? Just like there was a shot of an Exxon gas station. You probably saw it with the Exxon sign kind of just broken, laying down yeah. behind the reporter. Like that's a perfect symbol for what's wrong, right? We look what fossil fuels are doing to us. And it's happened again, of course, with Hurricane Ida. How would, how would hydrogen make that not keep happening because it sure seemed if mother nature could talk and she could send us messages sure seems like we didn't get the we didn't get the quiet cues we're getting the loud cues right now like wake up and smell the carbon or you guys are going to be sorry <laughs> that's how i take it so just real quickly i, I know roy probably wants to chime in but i'll just say that uh, enough energy falls on the earth in 45 minutes to power the entire planet for a full year sure. and so once that's happening on you know essentially every square inch of the planet including you know they have floating solar panels i don't know if you've seen them but they're they're in our, our documentary there's floating solar panels you can do on lakes and things like that china is doing this as well um on mass a massive scale you know, as soon as you can do things like that is produce wherever there's wind or solar or water, you know, wave energy or geothermal or hydro. So all of those renewable forms of energy, but intermittent, you can use to create hydrogen, but also, you know, all of the, all the biogases are, that are going to be produced anyway. So there's like, you know, an onion farmer in Oxnard, California, instead of spraying the onion waste and paying $700,000 a year, you know, to the state, because of all the methane that comes up, they throw it in a digester, and you can do this with anything, right? Cow manure, human manure, um, uh, hops from a, from a you know, a, a, a beer um, brewery, and yeah. Um, yeah, you you throw it in a digester, bacteria breaks it down, you're forming methane, you steal the hydrogen, you capture the, the carbon, and boom, you have yet another feedstock and another uh, um, you know, economic stream into creating hydrogen for everyone that you can then pipeline or truck wherever you need it. And I know why- we'll Roy's going to get a moment in a moment. I just want to say that methane is a huge problem and it sounds like such a win-win and methane of course is far more dangerous than even carbon dioxide doesn't last in the atmosphere as long, but causes a lot of harm. So that would seem to me, you've reminded me when Roy was educating me the other day, like that's such a win-win capture that methane, turn it into hydrogen. Roy, is that something you've been trying to bring to whoever the powers that be to make it happen? Well, we've been doing this for quite some time. I've been making hydrogen this way since 1964. <laughs> and, and, and basically because it's lower cost to do so, although I have reversible electrolyzers that are fuel cells or electrolyzers that are self-pressurizing, but you still have a lower cost hydrogen by breaking methane or anything else that you take out of that digester that would rot or burn. And but it's really important, as John said, to take the opportunity and make much more money out of solving the problem than it is to stew about whether or not we should have all electric or not. We can, we can use what we have to clean the air as it operates, make the scale that's necessary to support the fuel cell market that's coming. And, and you talked about California getting some money for hydrogen development. Is there anything in the infrastructure reconciliation bag that would, in an, on a national scale, help hydrogen? Uh, there's eight billion dollars for hydrogen hubs. I'm, I mean, I've looked at it. It, it, it's not, you know, from from my perspective, you know, the carbon capture portion of that of the bill uh, it has so much more detail. I think the the hydrogen hubs have a couple of paragraphs. So I'm not a hundred percent sure that that's actually going to go to infrastructure. Batteries are getting seven point five billion dollars for half a million charging stations. Um, it remains to be seen if we can get you know people to to switch over to those vehicles, which I think is a study that needs to be done. How many people are are going to switch over to that lifestyle? But uh, yeah, I mean we need to you know Chuck Schumer is certainly all for this, so uh, we need to get more senators. Uh, hydrogen has always been bipartisan; it's it's never been a partisan issue. So and you you'll see that in the doc once you get a chance to watch it, but. Um, yeah, anything we can do to build it. I, I think California is gonna, if they can get this $300 million though for just the charging infrastructure, um, that's gonna change everything. It is. Roy, last thoughts? 
Well, I think that it's all a matter of economics. We, we can no longer afford to ignore the crisis that we're in. It is far too expensive. And we can absolutely use the infrastructure that exists. And as John said, we can be doing so with a much better outcome for things that we now take for granted in the waste product neglect that allows it to become carbon dioxide or allows the waste become, to become uh, methane that isn't intended to with hydrogen and carbon production. And to end on an emotional note, because I got tear, teary eyed, John, when you were describing in that room on hydrogen, how you remember growing up with blue jays and abundant nature. And yeah. I'm older than you, so I remember a lot of that. And the concept of shifting baselines, which we will have to do a whole show on, is yeah. so scary because I grew up playing in my you know, local creek and watching little tadpoles turn into frogs. And that was my favorite yeah. thing to do. And all these things that, that I, that my daughter will not experience. And I hate to think what future grandchildren will miss, but the problem is they don't know what they're missing. Yeah. They don't yeah. like whether you can rely on, you know, that whether that you don't have to be scared is going to go too far too often in terms of, you know, danger and, and deadliness. So I just, I, that gives me goosebumps because that's what this is all about is preserving nature and how quickly in one generation, ours, baby boomers and a little bit behind have, you know, done so much damage, some, some of that unknowingly, but too much of it with knowledge of what we're doing. Yeah. The, 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 you know, the devastation that's happening to species around the planet is shocking. And we're going to be part of that if we're not careful, very careful. Insects, birds, I mean, penguins, polar bears, and guess what us, we're on the endangered list. Sure. And by the way, I contributed to a book. I, should plug that. It's called Climate Abandon, uh, how we're, why we're on the endangered list. And I did a chapter on media. And just to close, I've been, I had to leave mainstream media, CBS radio for many years to cover environmental news, did my own shows for many years, host, produced, paid for, marketed. They were popular. So don't let any network news executive dare tell me people don't want this. Yes, they do. If they didn't, then they sure do want to know what's going on now. And so I've been at war with the deniosaurs, you know, yeah. going literally into the den of the devil and telling Sean, you know, all these things that are true. I'm fueled by the facts, right? Uh, you guys are at war with the deniosaurs who would say hydrogen isn't going to work. So I'm hoping that by introducing you two, because of this interview, that you can have some spontaneous combustion and together <laughs> do something bigger than each of you individually could do and really bring hydrogen to the forefront to show people that not only this may not be the answer to everything, what is, but it certainly needs to be part of the mix. So I thank you very much for your time and your expertise and your dedication to this um, very important fuel. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you bet. Thank you.